Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce the special guest we have among us today, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, a man who needs no introduction. An author, politician, and former international civil servant, Dr. Tharoor straddles several worlds of experience. A Lok Sabha MP representing the Thiruvanthapuram constituency and chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Information Technology, he has previously served as Minister of State for Human Resource Development and Minister of State for External Affairs in the Government of India. During his nearly three decade long career at the United Nations, he served as a peacekeeper, refugee worker, and an administrator at the highest levels, serving as Under Secretary General during Kofi Annan's leadership of the organization. Dr. Tharoor is also a recognized authority on India, especially regarding its recent economic transformation and future prospects. Globalization, freedom of the press, human rights, literacy, culture, foreign affairs, cricket, and more. And he's a compelling and effective speaker, fluent in English, French, as well as in Malayalam and Hindi. He's the author of hundreds of articles, op-eds, and book reviews in a wide range of publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and so on. Dr. Tharoor is also an award-winning author of works of both fiction as well as non-fiction. His most notable non-fiction book includes Reasons of State. It is a study of Indian foreign policy making. While his India from Midnight to the Millennium is an acclaimed analysis of contemporary India, cited by President Clinton in his address to the Indian parliament. Nehru, The Invention of India is a biography of Pandit Nehru, India's first prime minister, an exposition on his intellectual outlook and vision. The Elephant, the Tiger and the Cell Phone, Reflections on India, compiles essays about contemporary Indian politics, society and culture. Pax Indica is a study of India's foreign relations and global strategy. His three novels consist of the classic, The Great Indian Novel, which is a required reading in several courses on post-colonial literature. Riot, a searing examination of Hindu-Muslim violence in contemporary India. And show business, which received a front page accolade in the New York Times book review and has since been made into a motion picture, Bollywood. Dr. Tharoor's books have also been translated into French, German, Italian, Polish, Romanian, Russian, Spanish, as well as Bengali, Malayalam, and Marathi. He is also a recipient of several awards that include the Sahitya Academy Award for his book, An Era of Darkness, in nonfiction category. He is also the recipient of Commonwealth Writers' Prize and the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman, India's highest honor for overseas nationals. Among numerous other awards are one for the New Age Politician of the Year from NDTV, the Hakim Khan Sur Award for National Integration, and the Priyadarshini Award for Excellence in Diplomacy. Dr. Tharoor, it is a great honor to have you here. Thank you so much for taking out time for this author session with our students. Thank you. It's good to be with you all. Thank you, sir. Now, may I request Dr. Amrita to please welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Tharoor. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Tharoor, for being here today, for sparing the time. As a student, I read the great Indian novel in, in college. And... Uh, <laughs> Some lines have stuck with me. Had it been a physical session, we would have honored you with a, with a bouquet, with a memento. But maybe virtually, I would like to just say those lines that have stuck with me since my days as a, as a college student. All knowledge is transient, linked to the world around it, and subject to changes as the world changes. There is so much within these few words, and there are so many, so many like that, that you have written. So it's wonderful, wonderful to have you as a part of this literature festival that is ongoing 
and I'm sure children are going to benefit. We really are looking forward to your words on living through the age of misinformation. That is the theme of this festival. Thank you very, very much. And I'm delighted to be with you all. I'm so glad you still remember sentences from a book, which is now, as you probably realize, is now 31 years old. So um, uh, I'm always delighted when people who weren't even born when the book came out approach me for autographs on new, new uh, reprints of it. Uh, wonderful to be addressing the GEMS audience, um, on, particularly on a topic as timely and critical as this one. Uh, GEMS is a, a, a wonderful institution. Uh, Sunny Varki, who founded it uh, and built it up to what it is today, is a good personal friend. And when he asked, I could scarcely say no. But I must say that um, one of the special things about GEMS, and many people don't know, is that it is the largest employer of British teachers in the world. There is apparently not even a British institution in Britain that employs as many British teachers as GEMS does. This, of course, is principally for an Indian audience today, but I thought it might be an amusing detail for them. Now, I think the topic that you have all chosen is especially important because most of the audience, I understand, are students, though I gather there are some teachers around as well. And let's face it, students, above all others, live much of their lives online, especially with the recent move to online education. And yet there is so much disinformation out there online that we need to address the phenomenon ourselves. Uh, I think the joke now is, is a very true uh, joke, is that if you are not on the internet, you are uninformed, but if you are on the internet, you are misinformed. Now, how do we manage to overcome that? There is no question that we must overcome it because disinformation is incredibly harmful. It not only debases online discourse, but it has very tangible and extremely harmful effects on the real world. Uh, for example, religious violence has resulted from internet uh, uh, in misinformation or disinformation. Targeted lynching has happened. Political propaganda has happened. It's distributed by everyone from media outlets to political figures to your friends and neighbors. And look at WhatsApp, for example. Uh, the number of, um, of, of really false and dangerous, insightful information that got circulated on WhatsApp prompted WhatsApp last year to limit the number of forwards. First in India, where many things can only be forwarded five times and some only once. And, and, and as a result, they've taken that practice worldwide as well. Political propaganda is all over the place with, with uh, uh, parties using social media, WhatsApp and so on, precisely in order to get out their messages, some of which may bear a very limited connection to the truth. And this is why we speak of disinformation, because it's being deliberately set out in order to make people believe things that are not necessarily true. And the truth is that it is incredibly important for everyone to question everything that they see online and not to accept <coughs> what you see at first glance. The most crucial weapon against disinformation is of course rigorous fact-checking. And there are now, fortunately, companies and websites that exist only to do that. Uh, there's a number that you've heard of in India, there's Boom, there's Halt News. Uh, there are a few others which um, specifically debunk uh, stories that have gained a certain amount of traction online by going into detail and providing facts and figures to reveal um, whether the information has been disseminated innocently or maliciously, if it's wrong, it should be corrected by fact checking. But I would say in truth, it is the job of every citizen to approach the internet with skepticism, not to believe, let alone to share everything one reads or sees. Um, and I think that is something which we learned the hard way because all of us, including myself, have shared information that later turned out to be false or inaccurate or even doctor. Now, this is important because the fact is that, um, that we've seen some rather tragic stories. There was one instance, for example, when rumors went rampant that a group of people were going around some villages um, in their cars to kidnap children 
uh, and take them away for sex trafficking and so on. And villagers then armed themselves and literally the next car that came by their village that they didn't know, um, they actually lynched the occupants of it. And this, there was one incident in Bengal when the Bengal government sent out a junior government official to reassure the villagers these rumors were not true and there was no such thing. The poor gentleman himself was dragged out of his car and lynched. So that's the amount of danger that false information can do. Uh, now, can we start teaching digital literacy in school curriculums? The fact is the teaching of computer use and digital literacy in schools um, is imperative, though my suggesting it sounds almost naive. I don't doubt that most school children <laughs> have more to teach adults about the internet than the other way around. But critical aspects of the online world are left unaddressed in classrooms. Amongst these is disinformation and the lack of knowledge makes one vulnerable. Being media savvy alone is no use if one does not have the equipment to judge the truth of what one is seeing. A Stanford University study, for example, showed troubling signs of ignorance among school students. They did a survey of about 3,500 3, students and found that the vast majority could not adequately question the veracity of the media reports they were shown. And this is especially dangerous with the current crises. There are masses of pandemic related fake news. And that's a great threat at a time of such uncertainty because we all need the right information in order to deal with COVID properly. But when there's as many lies out there as there are truths, how do we cope? I mean, just yesterday, there was this rather grim thing going around of a nurse who takes a vaccination on camera, starts giving a press conference about how important the vaccination is, and then apparently collapses. And according to the story that was going around WhatsApp, dies because of the vaccination. Now you can imagine people seeing that would imagine that she had been killed by the vaccination. Many people would not take the vaccination who might actually have needed it for their own survival. Now, this is a great threat at a time of such uncertainty because as a fact checking site has proven, the lady was a nurse. She had had a fainting spell that had nothing to do with the vaccination. She certainly didn't die. She's recovered and well, and she was shown on camera again. And, and the, the story was completely a fake story. But can you imagine how many people might have been discouraged from taking the vaccine if by seeing that story, they believed it had killed her. So we need to really turn to fact check more and more before we believe what we see on the internet. And if we wish to build a society of digitally literate, responsible internet users, I do believe we have to start in the schools. There are some interesting examples. In my home state of Kerala, which is also Mr. Sunny Varki's original home state, over 150 government schools have begun a, an initiative appropriately called Satya Meva Jayate, a rather wise slogan in today's confusing times, you know, truth alone triumphs. And Kerala has been harmed by fake news in the past, including through false information uh, on this subject of COVID and vaccines. Now what's happening is in these 150 government schools, every student from class eight through 12 receives training in identifying fake news and realizing its danger. And this is really commendable. Over 14 American states are teaching some form of media literacy. Clearly officials there are taking lessons from the ubiquity of fake news and political propaganda, which children will doubtless come into contact with as soon as they start using the internet if they haven't already. This was an election year and we've seen so much of fake news coming out, including some originating from the president himself in the US. Finland, Finland is the only country in the world where the internet and, and broadband Wi-Fi are officially declared as a human right. So if you don't get broadband internet, you can go to the courts and have it enforced as a human rights violation in Finland. Now, Finland has integrated anti-disinformation training beginning in primary school. In fact, they are therefore ranked as the European nation most resistant to fake news. I hope that India can one day aspire to that level of both skepticism 
and resilience. Now, digital literacy and anti-disinformation training, in my view, should be considered a critical part of any school curriculum. And I would really say to the GEMS educators here, after all, how can children appreciate a history class or engage in meaningful debate with their classmates if their heads are confused with false information and propaganda? So the school curriculum should train people in being able to judge reliably what sources of information can be relied upon and what cannot, how to expect footnotes or hyperlinks and how to chase them to look up the source. And I would say that for a brighter, more respectful and more informed citizenry, we in India must make these reforms as soon as possible. Because the internet isn't shrinking, it is growing and mutating and spreading. And every day we wait is therefore a chance for disinformation on the internet to worsen. I think I'll stop there so we can devote the rest of the time to an actual question and answer exchange. The floor is open to all of you. Thank you so much, sir. And I think um, uh, at GEMS, uh, we are doing the, that exact same thing. And the theme of this entire literature festival is uh, aimed at dispelling and having conversations around this uh, topic uh, of misinformation that is so much eroding uh, our systems. Uh, so now we have our students here who would like to interact with you. And of course. Ask, yeah. So may I invite uh, Jaspreet? Jaspreet? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. A very good afternoon, sir. I was desperately waiting for this moment. Oh, Jaspreet, good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So here I have my question for you. Who's your favorite author and why? Has anyone really inspired your style of writing? You know, uh, I, I love reading too much to have just one favorite author. And I've always followed the principle of reading very widely and very eclectically. So I have a wide range of things that I like. As a young person, I read mainly fiction. Of course, as a child, one reads stories, adventure books, and all of that stuff. And then as I grew older and started reading more nonfiction, I kept up the idea of trying to read as widely as I could. You can't help the fact that some subjects interest you more than others, and some right. authors will give you more pleasure than others. But I didn't want hmm. to confine myself to one genre. So as a teenager, my favorite writer and the one I read most diligently if I came across any book by him, whether in a library or in a bookshop or on a friend's uh, bookshelves or on my own, was P.G. Woodhouse, who is a British comic novelist, who's an absolute master of prose style and wrote very, very, very funny, intricately plotted and totally escapist books. So don't look for great, deep, dark, tragic meanings of life. But if you want to be uplifted in your spirits, and enjoy a good plot and a story rollickingly told in a very witty style, then P.G. Woodhouse remains my favorite. Uh, as I grew a bit older, got into my 20s, I mm. discovered other styles of writing. For example, I, I discovered Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the, um, the oh. Colombian magic realist writer, before he'd won the Nobel Prize, but through the, the best book he wrote, 100 Years of Solitude, which I would recommend to everybody as a masterpiece of the genre, but also something that convinces each of us readers of the power of the human imagination, the power of stories. Then, in a very different way, some of the East European uh, writers who had a, a very different relationship to reality uh, from, from um, uh, Garcia Marquez, I mean, and the magic realists of Latin America, uh, including people like Mario Vargas Llosa, uh, many other writers in Latin America adopted variants of magic realism. In East Europe, for example, there's a writer called Milan Kundara, who mm, wrote a couple yes. of unforgettable books which are anchored in almost hyper-realism. And they were very much reactions to the straitjacket, the oppressive straitjacket of communist rule in their countries. I would particularly recommend The Unbearable Lightness of Being and The Book of Laughter and Forgetting. By, by Kundera. Uh, then, of course, um, uh, some of the modern British and American novelists have a lot of good qualities. Uh, for historical fiction, there's Hilary Mantel. Uh, A.S. Byatt is one of, it's her sister, actually, and is a wonderful, um, wonderful, uh, serious novelist of, of, um, of 
really interestingly written and demanding works. I find that in America, John Updike and Philip Roth were the modern novelists I most enjoyed reading. Um, both of them had a, a tremendous, tremendous verve with the English language. And I've always been captivated by the wielding of words uh, to effect. So whereas the East Europeans and the Latin Americans you're reading in translation, then the, 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 uh, the English and American writers, you are seeing the vigor of the language come out uh, in their own effective creations. Now, those are just a handful of names, but they're by no means an exhaustive list. And I would say that uh, the more you can read, the more you discover. As recently as about four years ago, five years ago, I discovered a novelist I'd never read before, a Swedish novelist in translation called Jonas Jonsson, who wrote one of the funniest books I've read since Woodhouse, a book called The 100-Year-Old Man Who Stepped Out of a Window and Disappeared. That's the title of the book. And, uh, and, and I've just acquired, but not yet read the sequel, Further Adventures of the 100-Year-Old Man. It's very, very clever, very funny, a sort of combination of Forrest Gump and P.G. Woodhouse and, and, and history and comic caper all rolled into one. So there's always good stuff being written. I would just urge you all to read enough to know what you like and then to pick up anything that seems interesting and find out by reading it whether you liked it or not. You can only sharpen your own taste by reading. The more you read, the more you know what you will enjoy. And I think you'll find it very difficult to say I have one favorite writer because there's so much of good writing. I haven't even mentioned the Indian writers in English. And I'm very fond of most of them. I will actually pick up Indian writings uh, very often now, more often than I'll pick up Western novels, uh, even from the canon, because my feeling is these are the writers who need to be known better, who need to be appreciated more. And so this year, for example, I've set up on reading four Indian novels um, in translation from Malayalam, my mother tongue. Unfortunately, I didn't grow up in Kerala. So my Malayalam is reasonably fluent to speak in and make political speeches in, but to read novels would, would, would be a, an arduous task since I, I was never educated in Kerala. So reading them in translation is my way out. And then I had some four uh, novels that I have read. And one day I'll, I'll, I'll certainly want to write an article about all four of them when I finally find, find the time to finish them. And you'll get a sense that there's a lot of exciting things happening in Indian writing that we all should appreciate and enjoy as well. Right, sir. Thank you so much for your answer. I totally agree with you. Good, Jasmine. Good luck in your reading. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And I, I am sure that our students must be taking notes of all the books that you suggested to read. And of course, regarding Malayalam translations, I think there are very few available uh, in English and, I, and they are such wonderful writings. And I also wish there were more translations available. So that for used to be true. That used to be true and, and that's changing now. And this year, uh, there's an absolutely uh, uh, brilliant series of high quality translations that have come out. That's why I picked up four of them. There's uh, the, the uh, magic realist uh, satirical novelist, uh, Unni who has written a book called The Cock That Was a Culprit. Uh, then there's um, the great, uh, extremely you know, prize-winning, seriously regarded eminent novelist Mukundan, whose novel on Delhi, uh, called Delhi a Soliloquy, has come out uh, in English just a, a month or two ago. I launched it in English, so I can tell you. Um, then I have Harish's Mustache, which just won a major literary prize, um, defeating novels in English. And he, it's a translation from Malayalam. And there's uh, T.P. Rajivan's book about the man who learned to fly but could not land, which is about the nationalist movement. I've just begun reading that. So four high quality Malayalam books, all translated into very good English and widely now available. So do not underestimate how much there is now. It used to be different. When I was a kid, you could practically get nothing and the translations were terrible. Today, yeah. there's a lot more available and very good quality translations. And that will awesome. probably be true of Bangla and of Odisha and of Gujarati and all the other languages and literatures we haven't known enough before. We should all be reading much more translations. And Jem should start uh, perhaps also encouraging their students to read some good translated Indian fiction. That's, that's mm -hmm. wonderful, in fact, sir. Uh, in fact, in this literature festival, since this is the first one that we're doing it at an all India level, we have limited ourselves to English and Hindi just two languages. But in the forthcoming ones in near future, we plan to incorporate as many languages as we can. And of course, 
literature and translation, definitely. And literature and translation is getting recognition. For example, the Karnataka novelist Vivek Shanbhag, who writes in Kannada, uh, wrote a book called Gochar Gochar, uh, Gachar Gochar, I think it's the title, which actually uh, won international literary prize ahead of writings in various world languages. So we're not just talking about, you know, uh, any sort of patronizing approach to this writing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about world-class writing coming out of Indian language. That is so true. So true. I'm sure we can quickly have the next question, children. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so next is Niharika. Niharika, please go ahead with your uh, question. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. It's so nice to meet you at last. So my question for you is, uh, what is your, what is the inspiration behind your book, The Great Indian Novel? Hi, Niharika. Thank you. Um, I think there may be a slight uh, connectivity issue with your, with your Wi-Fi. Um, just watch out. But anyway, just to say, Niharika, that The Great Indian Novel was actually prompted um, by uh, two things. One was my um, own desire. I had just turned 30. And as somebody who had always been a quote unquote precocious child, I was feeling a bit embarrassed that all I had was by way of books was one book, which is my PhD thesis rehashed. And I said, surely I should have written another book by now, I've written a good novel. After all, as a child, I published my first short story. I first started writing stories when I was six and I my first one was published when I was 10, and here I was 20 years later, and I kind of had this feeling and this, this epiphany that I had wasted my life. So I said, I've got to write a novel. And I was mulling over various ideas, um, but then it so happened, I was also a very avid reader, and I was reading a translation, or as he would call it, a transcreation of the Mahabharata by Professor P. Lal, which I would warmly recommend to all of you. It is such a lively, a rendering of, of the Mahabharata. He distills the essential story into one volume, writes it in a very contemporary style, uh, but it's still a, a, a trans, translation of the original. Uh, he is a Sanskritist himself, so he knows what he's doing or knew what he was doing. He's passed away, sadly. So when I was reading it, I said, my gosh, you know, two things struck me. First of all, the Mahabharata was told and retold by people for 800 years from roughly 400 BC to 480. Why did we stop retelling it, I asked. And then reading the transcreation and seeing how lively and interesting it could be, I thought, imagine if we were retelling the Mahabharata today in the 20th century, what would it be? Because in those days, the Mahabharata in the retellings often incorporated stories of the great events, the great ideas, the great rulers of that time. So various interpolations came into the Mahabharata. So I said, let me try this. And just for fun, I sat down and, and started writing uh, the great Indian novel, great being Maha, Indian being Bharat. And so the Mahabharata coming into my novel, the great Indian novel. So I started writing that. And I wrote about 32 pages, had a great time, put it aside. I was a working man. I had a full day job at the United Nations coming home in the evening. And I had two small toddlers at home, so it's not as if I had a lot of spare time. But I remember my brother-in-law came visiting. We were living in Geneva at that time. And one day when I was working at my computer, he was sitting um, in the easy chair and he picked up this manuscript that was sitting there and idly started reading it. And then I could see out of the corner of my eye, he was reading and enjoying and reading and reading. And then he gets to the last page and he turns looking for more. And then he said, where's the rest of this? And I said, there isn't any, I haven't written any more. And he said to me, you've got to write this. This is fabulous. So thus inspired, I decided to try and continue the story. Um, remember, I'd never published a, a fiction book before. So I, I wrote up to um, 100 pages and sent it off to an agent in the UK to ask if it was any good. And um, she replied saying it was terrific and she'd be happy if I would continue it. And so that gave me the confidence to continue writing. The final thing I think in TypeScript was over 600 pages. The um, printed book, I remember still vividly, 432 pages of rather small, dense type. So it turned out to be a fairly hefty work. And when you're writing a first novel, you put everything you want to say into it. So I threw in all my ideas about the epics, about spirituality, about philosophy, about life. I threw in all the history that I could think of about the freedom struggle. Uh, I merged them all together in the story. I wrote light verse, comic verse, doggerel. 
it, it became an extraordinarily ambitious effort. But what makes me very happy is like uh, when today, for example, um, uh, your, your uh, Dr. Amrita Bora uh, came online and said that she read it as a college student. And today I'm getting college students who weren't born at the time the book came out saying they're reading it. That shows me that I wrote something that's worth having written. So thank you for bringing back those memories, Niharika. Thank you, sir, for your answer. Very I mean, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Niharika. Uh, so moving on, Dia. Good afternoon, sir. It's an honor asking a question to you. Thanks, Dia. I, want, I wanted to know, did the publication of your very first book bring any change in the process of writing for you as an author? How, what, and why? Okay, well, I had actually two first books in a sense, because my literally my very first book was my doctoral thesis, which was published um, in 1981 under the title Reasons of State, uh, Political Development and India's Foreign Policy and the Making of India's Foreign Policy under Indira Gandhi, 1966 to 77. So it was a very uh, scholarly work with footnotes and, and fairly dense academic jargon, even though I tried to strip out some of the more academic stuff from my thesis to write the book. But I would say that at the end of the day, that didn't change very much for me. I got some good reviews. I got a few bad reviews. I got some attention. The book sold out very quickly. The publishers didn't bother to reprint it. Um, a handful of people interested in foreign policy read it and, and, and showed their respect for me by reaching out to me. They included people like the columnist AJ Nurani and the politician Jaswan Singh. Uh, and, and that ultimately uh, uh, gave me a certain credibility among a certain segment of the foreign policy community. But um, it can't really, I can't really say change my life because I didn't stay in academics. I was already working at the UN when the book came out and I wasn't working in the field of Indian foreign policy. But the great Indian novel certainly had the potential to change my life. And that was my first novel or the first book, frankly, that, that um, you may have had in mind when you asked the question because the Great Indian Novel is best, best known as my first book, even though Reasons of State was a good eight years earlier. The Great Indian Novel changed my life in two or three ways. First of all, because of the attention it got, the prizes it won, the, the uh, huge amount of reviews, uh, it was translated around the world, published in Indian editions, US edition, Australian edition, um, English edition, all of that. It became, it became a huge bestseller. It started getting prescribed in uh, Commonwealth literature courses and so on. It, again, put me in a certain um, level, as it were, as an Indian English writer, which had I not been a UN uh, employee and not been full time occupied with other work, might have given me a launch pad to develop a, a, a fairly serious career as a full time writer. The fact that I didn't do it is my own fault, because I was also the kind of person who enjoyed what I was doing in the UN, didn't want to give that up, and frankly, couldn't afford to give it up because uh, writing as some of you will discover if you try and do it full time, is not a terribly remunerative profession. Uh, but um, I think that, that that may have been something which, um, which changed. Uh, what it changed in the process of writing, if I heard you say that right, is I think the, the confidence that publication gives any writer. The first time an article of mine appeared in print, I was much more confident writing the second article. Similarly, when I published a novel the first time, I. I, I, I was very confident about writing the second one. Indeed, I wrote the second one much faster. Uh, that's my novel, Show Business, which uh, came out uh, in 1992. So one could argue that as far as, uh, as, far as uh, process of writing is concerned, um, two things I discovered. One is, yes, indeed, confidence in further writing. But secondly, I, it convinced me that the telling of the tale is as important as the tale itself. In other words, I... With that uh, Great Indian novel and its success, I abandoned the idea of writing a conventionally unfolding novel. I I'm not knocking conventional writing. There's some very, very good, for Vikram said, Suitable Boy, it's a very conventional novel, but it tells a marvelous story very well. So I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that for me, um, experimenting with style and form was also important. So the Great Indian novel takes on the uh, the manner of an epic narrative, it breaks into verse occasionally, all that uh, show business is told in different takes uh, as, as in a movie with intercut monologues by different characters. 
and the, the storylines of the different movies, the, the tongue in cheek, of course, that the actor is acting in. And then my third novel, Riot, has 13 different voices giving their own versions of the truth in such a way that the story that emerges of the riot I'm describing can be understood and refracted through these different perspectives. And no one except the reader knows the whole story. So that kind of thing for me has been important. And if I go back to fiction, I'll have to really look at ways of, of trying to see if I can do something sufficiently original with style, while at the same time coming up with, with something readable that tells a story that will grip the reader. So I think that may be the final lesson that that, that book changed for me. Thank you, Dia. Thank you for sharing your experience with budding writers like us, sir. We'll surely Thanks. benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you, Dia. And I'm sure Dr. Tharoor, listening to your journey, it's inspiring so many students today that take your first step and that will give you confidence to move ahead and ahead. So thank you so much. We'll have our next question from Ashi. Good afternoon, sir. It's really great speaking to you, even though it's online. <laughs> thank you, Ashi. Uh, my question to you is, in current times, the younger generation of this country face many issues about self-identity. We are all somewhere between Western ideas and Indian traditions. How do you think this will impact the future of Indian literature? Well, you know, if literature is at least partly about self-exploration by the author, in other words, of the author, by asking herself or himself uh, who they are and what matters to them, is able to lay bare for the reader uh, ideas, thoughts, feelings, reflections, and experiences that will make the reader also interrogate themselves, then I think you have your answer, Ashi. That is, we are a, a society that is, and every society, by the way, can say something similar, but we are a society that's been influenced by many, many different currents. Uh, we are not the pure Vedic civilization that some in the Hindutva movement wish we were, or pretend we are. Uh, nor have we only been impacted upon by successive uh, invasions from the Northwest and, and Muslim rule or Mughal rule, uh, uh, because in different parts of the country, there are different experiences of that too. And nor have we, can we aff afford to forget 200 years of British colonialism, even though it's ended. The fact is it left us amongst other things with English language, with aspects of our education system, our administrative system, and so on and so forth. So we do have all of these legacies contending. Now, each legacy gives us access to something different, gives us affinities to something different in the world. And therefore, I would suggest that all of these things give us wider possibilities and horizons for us to explore. Through the English language, we have access to much of world literature, certainly to uh, literature in the English language and in translation from other languages into English, because let's face it, not, of, not all of us who grew up reading Spanish or French or German or Czech or, or whatever, but all of these books, all the great books in these languages have been made available uh, through good English translations. And because we have English, uh, we're able to access them very easily and discover the world that way. Similarly, exposure to Islamic art influences, Islamic festivals and so on in our society mean that we are comfortable. Why is it that Indians have made such a good fit in the Gulf countries of the Middle East, for example. It's because um, they, they have grown up in a society in which people of different faiths, including the Islamic faith, um, are their friends, neighbors, co-workers coexist. Uh, in South India, particularly in Kerala, we have a very significant Christian minority, which goes back, way back, in fact, to, the, to soon after the lifetime of Jesus Christ. It is said that St. Thomas, doubting Thomas the Apostle, landed on the shores of Kerala, where equally legend has it, he was welcomed on shore by a flute playing, flute playing Jewish girl, because the Jews fleeing the destruction of their temple had also crossed the Arabian Sea and come to Kerala. So we are used to diversities in places like Kerala. And I believe that on the whole Indian history and Indian civilization has learned to accept difference because of the coexistence of diversities. And all of these just multiply the options for us. So not just in our literature and our writing, but also I hope in our ideas, in our political life, and in the global future we'll have to build, I hope all of these things will work in this way, Ashi. Thank you very much. 
you ashi and listening to you uh, dr tharur it's like bringing back the fact that we are proud to be indians you have put it it in such a brilliant form and all the students listening here we are proud to be indians so yes aryan will take the next question greetings sir hi aryan quote yeah quote India has been born and reborn scores of times, and it will be reborn again. Unquote. This is one of your popular statements. If you could please shed some light on this. Well, first of all, it's an old idea. It's, it's, I can't claim a great deal of originality for the fact that uh, we come from a civilization which has a number of philosophical assumptions about birth. and rebirth i mean the whole idea of punar janmam and 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 uh, reincarnation and so on which is very much in hindu thought uh, is an example of that but i'm not just referring to that what i am referring to is the idea that um there's nothing immutable about india or indianness because just as i said in answer to the previous question the india of let us say um the ancient hindu past got reborn for example as buddhist india under ashoka that got reborn as a different kind of hindu india under the guptas in the north or the cholas the pallavas uh, in the south uh, or the vijayanagar empire in the south held held sway as one kind of india while the delhi sultanate was holding holding sway in the north as another kind of india then you had the mughal uh, mughal india which is again a rebirth of the indian idea uh, under under an islamic uh, emperor Uh, then you had uh, British India, which, which, as a colonial possession of the British Raj, again implies a sort of rebirth. Then comes 1947, our freedom, our independence, and India is again reborn. So this kind of birth and rebirth has kept happening, and it would show a very naive uh, ignorance of history for us to say that now it's settled forever; it will never be reborn again. There's an ongoing struggle to decide. exactly what we are all about there is an ongoing struggle to figure out what india is all about and today as i've said in my newest book the battle of belonging there is a battle between one notion of indianness and indian nationalism which is a notion enshrined in the constitution a notion that can be summarized as civic nationalism that is a nationalism that uh, regards everybody in india as equal and the hindutva idea of india which says that this country is principally a hindu land and others live here uh, only on the sufferance of the hindus as either guests or as interlopers now these are different ideas of indianness which are being fought out and depending on which one wins there is indeed a risk uh, of india being reborn some critics have already said that maybe we are seeing the birth of a second republic right now after the uh events of the last uh, uh year and a half since this government was reelected so i think it's rather important to realize that the idea is very simply that we will continue to deal with an india um that is under pressure to change is under pressure in a in a very um uh, uh, constructive way as well as in a very destructive way and what we indians living at the time of that pressure make of our country is what the rebirth is going to consist of but i'm not afraid of pressure i think we should stand up to it and face it it's often said that there is no wine without the grapes being pressed and there will not be a better india without the existing india coming under pressure as it now has just as each of us um has to live with pressure as well i fear we've run out of time it seems but i'll I'll, I'll go. I'll thank you first of all, Aryan, for your question. Thank you. And thank I'll you, see sir. if there's thank anything you, else coming from the organizers. Thank you so much, sir. I know we are running out of time. Uh, would you uh, mind one more question? One last. One last question. question. Sure. Sure. Pleasure. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Anag, can you please ask your question? Sure, ma'am. So a very good afternoon, sir. And I'm speechless today, seeing you in front of me, seeing my idol in front of me. I'm a huge. Nice of you, Anag. <laughs> Thank you. I stayed up long nights reading your books like An Era of Darkness, Why Am I a Hindu? And my questions today are uh, my one question today is based on that. So as okay. you have written a lot of books on India's struggle against the British and you have narrated it very well, I love your ideas, I love your thought process. And uh, the question I'd like to ask you is that uh, 
what is your opinion on the much debated question of history being a subjective narrative and uh, i would love if you put some light on my era of darkness on this question <laughs> i don't think you have any darkness you're a very impressive young man and again your question itself is not of a level i would have expected from a school student so well done that's the kind of question to get in graduate school not even undergraduate college but let me just say that um, that that the question of whether history is subjective in my view um it is i think that as far as um um as far as any historian is writing with a claim of, of objectivity i think that claim falters at the very moment the historian chooses what to write about i don't think anyone uh is because you can't write everything right so many things are happening if somebody is writing the story of 2020 they'll select what to write about they may write about covid i hope they will because that's what the year has been about but they may leave out other important events that affected all sorts of people's lives now similarly when you're cho choosing a subject in history the very facts that you choose to focus on or the personages you uh, and the events that you choose to focus on imply an act of selection and that act of selection is a subjective act if if i ask you in 10 years time to write a book on uh, british colonialism in india it won't be my book it'll be anag's book and it'll be very different because you will choose different things that captured your attention to write about so that's the first thing secondly every human being is a separate individual that human being has his or her own experiences own um, biases prejudices dislikes likes heroes villains in their minds and that's bound to spill over however rigorously they try to uh, keep it out of their academic or scholarly work it's bound to spill over in the way in which they treat the subject uh, you can have a, the same set of facts you may want to give someone the benefit of the doubt i may only see it something you know or vice versa so again subjectivity comes in and we are seeing subjectivity carried almost to an extreme uh, in the indian political space where the subjectivity of history is being misused by some political parties and i think you all know who i mean to actually rewrite history textbooks in order to push a particular point of view now they are not only admitting to be subjective themselves they are essentially accusing the existing books of being subjective too on the other side so it looks like both sides either in defending the existing books or in seeking to rewrite them today are essentially admitting the subjectivity of the history of either version so all i will say is if you as you are growing up are fascinated by history as you may be and as i certainly was read widely uh in fact um somebody had even asked me uh, what did you do in, in your childhood or as a teenager that helped you become an author and my answer always was i read i read and read and read and maybe i was lucky that i grew up in an india where i had no television obviously computers didn't exist nintendo hadn't been invented playstation wasn't even a gleam in an inventor's eye and on top of everything else i was an asthmatic so i couldn't go out and play as much as i wanted to and so i was stuck at home reading struggling to breathe and reading but as a result i read so widely and eclectically there was a making of me as a writer and a thinker and i'll say to you as somebody interested in history read widely and then you'll decide what you like so for example before writing this book an era of darkness that you were kind enough to read i read both the classic so called objective histories and the uh, twisted ones particularly in recent years in which british historians have attempted to pat their ancestors on the back by praising what was done by british colonialism in india uh, lawrence james and neil ferguson andrew roberts have all written books in which they have claimed that the british empire lawrence james's words uh, were the greatest act of altruism known in human kind which is is you know frankly the one of the greatest acts of balderdash i have seen perpetrated by a writer uh, and and at the same time argued therefore that india should be grateful to the british for having oppressed us looted us pillaged us and so on and i thought therefore it was important to know what the other side was selecting so that i could respond and i wrote my book built around an argument rather than a narrative my argument was here are the things the british claim we should be grateful for and this is why we shouldn't be grateful and that was essentially 
what I wrote and I took all the things that they wanted to take credit for, railways, parliament, democracy, the English language, globalization, you name it, everything one after the other. And I pointed out that everything they brought in, they brought in for their own benefit, to enhance their own control, to increase their own profits, and never for the benefit of Indians. And, and it's important, I thought, to make that point. Now, clearly, some people in Britain say, oh, this is very subjective history. Yes, it is. It's my subjectivity, and I'm proud to stand by it. Equally, you guys have had plenty of people writing subjective histories from the British point of view. It's time that the empire struck back. Thank you so much, sir. I'm enlightened. Thank Pleasure. you, sir. And I think the Oxford Union speech was also very uh, powerful around this and conveyed the message. And I think it's liked and reliked and um, shared so much. Uh, thank you. So thank you so much, sir, for taking out time and spending it with our, this young, uh, budding authors, aspiring authors, and uh, literary um, students are interested in literature. Um, I would request now, uh, Amrita ma'am, to please uh, give the vote of thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you indeed. I know we've exceeded time, so I'm not going to take too much time. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you. You have been such a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, person to talk to the children. Uh, I think we have learned lessons uh, in humility. We've always been reading your work and we've, we've heard you speak uh, at so many forums. But today, this was the first time when I heard you speak and many of us here with children. And uh, just sharing here, which uh, I got to know today that the Global Teacher Prize, which this year an Indian teacher has won, thankfully, is also something that for the first time 10 years ago, you were the one who launched. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much in so many ways. I think you've totally, totally thoroughly inspired us. And this session today is going to be etched in our memories as children and as educators and as parents forever and ever. Thanks a thank time. Th th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amrita Vora. And let me thank the kids who asked questions. And I feel my apologies are due to the kids who didn't have a chance to ask questions. I'm sure that many had come prepared. Uh, it's wonderful to see them all there. And I, I must say how impressed I am with the very high quality of the questions that were asked and the confidence and fluency with which the kids asked them. So I think some credit goes to their teachers as well. Congratulations to all of you and to GEMS International School. Go ahead. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you.